everybody and welcome to this overview of female pelvic floor and core anatomy. So just a little orientation first. If you put one hand on your tummy and one hand on your rear end, um, you can see just above here is the pubic bone. So this would be around the abdominal wall and we have the bladder opening out into the urethra. We have the uterus coming down to the vagina and we have the rectum sitting on top of the sacrum and the coccyx and then opening out through the anus and then behind here our gluteus maximus hopefully. So that's the orientation of the organs of the pelvis. If we want to talk about the different structures that make up the, the female pelvic core and floor we're going to start at the top and work our way down. So we're going to talk about the diaphragm first of all and the diaphragm is probably one of the most interesting muscles in the body. So it's attached to the lower six costal margins, it's attached to the undersurface of the ziphoid sternum and it interacts with a lot of different muscles both in the anterior and posterior abdominal walls. So it interdigitates with rectus abdominis, with transversus, also with psoas and with quadratus lumborum and fascially it's connected to pubococcygeus as well as functionally it's connected to the pelvic floor. It's also connected to the lumbar vertebrae which means that breathing is a really strong indicator of spinal health and function as well. We know that in, in women particularly with back pain, breathing, bladder control and bowel function are more connected with back pain in women than BMI or level of activity. So this is your diaphragm, this lovely double domed muscle. We've got the heart sitting here on top. We've got the lungs inside the rib cage. And again, coming down to L3 on the right and L2 on the left. Moving over, we've got the anterior abdominal wall. So you can see rectus abdominis coming down from either side of the ziphoid sternum down to the pubic symphysis. We have the obliques interdigitating beautifully with the serratus anterior muscle coming in, forming part of that sheath, that rectus sheath, around your six pack muscles here as well. And of course the pectoral muscles on top, pec major, superficially, pec minor underneath. If we look underneath the anterior abdominal wall, and you can see here serratus anterior coming down onto the lower rib cage, we have the digestive organs. So you can see the large intestine coming from inside the right uh, iliac bone, up, across and down, and the small intestine here in front. If we move over to the posterior abdominal wall, so we've got the anterior abdominal wall, the posterior abdominal wall, we're really thinking about, yes, the diaphragm still, but we've got psoas coming down, attaching to the lumbar vertebrae, interdigitating with the diaphragm along the lumbar vertebrae, coming down and inserting into the lesser trochanter of the femur. You've got iliacus or liacus uh, attached to the inner surface of the pelvic girdle and it comes down and it attaches with psoas to the lesser trochanter as well. But don't call it iliopsoas. It's iliacus and psoas. They're two different muscles with two different functions. And you can see here just above the pubic symphysis at the front of the pelvis, we've got the bladder, We've got the uterus and then in behind we've got the rectum. We've got the kidney sitting up either side of the spine as well. So those are the roof and the walls of the, the canister in the centre of the body. Let's talk about the pelvis. So if we're thinking and talking about the pelvis, we want to think about the different joints of the pelvis. We have the symphysis pubis in front and then around the other side of the same bone we have the sacroiliac joints. How much do the sacroiliac joints really move? Mm, probably about three degrees or two millimeters. So they barely move. There's a small amount of movement there, but hardly any at all. We do have about 12 to 15 degrees of movement at our coccyx though. And that's a really important part of the body to consider when it comes to pelvic health, because so many different structures are attached to it pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, ischiococcygeus, as well as some of the ligaments that we're going to talk about. So the bony pelvis, as we like to call it, we've got the sacrum wedged down between the two ilia here, 
and it's stabilized and it is a very very stable structure it doesn't go out of alignment easily at all unless you're in a major major car crash but it is partially stabilized by the wedge shape of the sacrum sitting down between the two ilia but also by these large ligaments and the two most important ones that we're going to talk about here are the sacrotuberous ligament What's lovely about a lot of the structures in the pelvis is that they're very logically named. So the sacrotuberous ligament goes from the sacrum to the greater tuberosity. And it interdigitates as well. It continues down into biceps femoris of the hamstring muscles. So if you have tight hamstrings, that can cause a little bit of pain and irritation up around the back of the pelvis and into the SI joint. Underneath the sacrotuberous, we have the sacrospinous ligament. So I've taken off the sacro tuberous on this side so you can see it. And this comes from this lower part of the sacrum down into the coccyx and it attaches over here to the ischial spine on the pelvis. So really, really strong structures, keeping everything where it's supposed to be. So your pelvis doesn't go out of place. It doesn't go out of alignment. It's a really strong, stable part of your body. Now, we need to talk about the muscles of the pelvis. We want to talk about the pelvic floor muscles and the pelvic wall muscles. So we have three layers of pelvic floor muscle. I'm actually going to grab this model here for a sec. Just to orient you here, here's the symphysis pubis, here's the coccyx. So women have three openings in their perineum and we have three layers of pelvic floor muscles. Men have three layers of pelvic floor muscles too, but the main difference is that women have a lot more muscles in our layer two of the pelvic floor. So layer one, these are small muscles, small but very important muscles, and they are all about sphincteric closure and sexual function. So we have bulbo cavernosus going from either side of the clitoris, or underneath the labia, and inserting down into the perineal body. We have ischiocavernosus, again, going lateral from the clitoris down towards the ischial tuberosity. We also have, we've got the perineal body here, and we've got the superficial transverse perineal muscle coming here, and we have the external anal sphincter. Those are all your layer one muscles. So these muscles are really psychologically sensitive as well. If there's any fear or anxiety or anticipation of pain, those muscles can become short and tight and unhappy. So those are your layer one muscles. Your layer two muscles, I don't have a picture of those with me, unfortunately, but we're talking about your external urethral sphincter. You've got your compressor urethra, which comes in from the side of the pelvis, wraps around the urethra and attaches the other side. You've got your deep transverse perineal muscle, which runs directly underneath your superficial transverse perineal muscle. And you have your sphincter urethrovaginalis, which is like a figure of eight around the urethra and the vagina. Your layer one muscles are very connected functionally and fascially to your adductor muscles. So your adductors are all attached along here, along the outside part of the ischiopubic ramus. Your layer one pelvic floor muscles are just the other side of that bony ridge. Your layer two pelvic floor muscles are fascially and functionally connected to your deep abdominals. So if you have surgery across here, a C-section or a hysterectomy, um, cancer surgery, um, oftentimes what can happen is the function of the deep abdominals and your layer two pelvic floor muscles can become a little bit hindered by scar tissue restrictions and that can lead to some bladder frequency urgency situations here. So really important that we get good scar mobility on the anterior abdominal wall afterwards. Your layer three pelvic floor muscles and these are your pubococcygeus muscles, your iliococcygeus, uh, you know, big muscles, relatively speaking, in the pelvic floor. And their job is to support the organs. So here's the bladder, the uterus, and the rectum, and they sit on this shelf of muscles. So the collective name for your layer three muscles is levator ani, because when they contract, 
they elevate the anus, they lift. Layer one and layer two, open and close. Layer three lifts. So we have pubococcygeus, and the really important subdivision here is puborectalis. So pubococcygeus goes from the pubic bone to the coccyx. Puborectalis goes from the pubic bone down a little sling around the rectum and back up again. Iliococcygeus comes from more the lateral wall of the pelvis, but still coming down and attaching to the coccyx. Our pelvic wall muscles are really important as well. So coccygeus, we used to call the muscle ischiococcygeus, now we just call it coccygeus, is coming from the coccyx and it's attached over towards the ischial spine. But the two muscles that often don't get mentioned and are really important in female pelvic health are your pelvic wall muscles, piriformis and obturator internus. So piriformis is coming from the anterior surface of the sacrum and then it leaves the pelvis and it comes out and it inserts into the trochanter. Your obturator internus, you can see it here through the obturator foramen, does the same thing, it wraps around the inside wall of the pelvis and then it leaves the pelvis at a right angle to insert into the femur. So unfortunately this model is a little bit battered, but we can see here if we move the sciatic nerve, this big yellow nerve out of the way, here's your piriformis coming out of the pelvis and inserting into the trochanter. Here is your obturator internus muscle. Let me just hold that up here. So that's obturator internus. And you can see, if we turn this pelvis around, it's coming from inside the pelvis, takes a right angle and inserts with the other deep hip rotators into the greater trochanter. So these muscles are really important in female pelvic anatomy and function because particularly as we get older, uh, we lose, after the age of 35, we lose about 2% of our striated urethral sphincter muscles every year. But the research does show if we have strong, happy pelvic wall muscles, that can really help support the levator ani function and keep the pelvic organs happy and healthy and functional. However, we don't want muscles in the pelvic wall, piriformis and obturator, that are too short and tight. We've all come across people with unhappy piriformis situations, and that can lead to nerve irritation. Which brings me on to the innervation of the muscles of the pelvic floor. So when I was a baby physio 150 years ago, we learned that C3, 4 and 5 keeps your diaphragm alive. When you move into pelvic health, you learn that S2, 3 and 4 keeps pee and poo off the floor because those are the nerve roots of your pudendal nerve which supplies quite a bit of the not only the motor function but also the sensory function in around the pelvis and has a bad name for being a major driver of pelvic pain you may have heard of pudendal neuralgia so the pudendal nerve has a very circuitous course through the pelvis it comes out from s2 3 and 4 and it travels along per with piriformis it leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic notch, but then it changes its mind and it comes back into the pelvis in between your sacral tuberous and your sacral spinous ligament. So you can see why having tight pelvic floor muscles and tight hamstrings might be problematic. Once it's back in the pelvis, it travels down in Alcock's canal underneath obturator internus, and then it emerges medial to the ischial tuberosity and splits into three branches. So there are some anatomic variations, but generally we've got the branch coming down here, the inferior rectal or hemorrhoidal nerve supplies the area here. You've got the perineal nerve, which supplies the area here. And then the dorsal branch travels up underneath ischial cavernosus, up as far as the symphysis pubis, emerges underneath and then hooks over into either the clitoris or the penis depending on what you have. Nothing happens in isolation in your body 
And of course, we have to look at any pelvic health dysfunction from a biopsychosocial perspective, particularly because this is a very emotionally laden part of the body. But if you can think about the connection between breathing and pelvic health, if you can think about the connection between digestive health and pelvic floor muscle function, if you can think about how the anterior and posterior abdominal wall, along with the diaphragm and the pelvic floor, all have to be firing on all cylinders to recover adequately from diastasis, to deal with back pain, you'll see the wonderful, elegant design and complexity of female pelvic floor and core anatomy. Hope you enjoyed this short video, this guided tour through the female pelvis. And if you have any questions, just tag me in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.